Okay, then the next part, I think the explanation on the study guide is actually quite clear, but I still want to do maybe the first two questions. Okay, I think I can enlarge this a bit. Okay, again, I repeat what I mentioned at the end of the last video. This is the correct regression, y as a function of x2 and x3, and then I commit underfitting in the next regression. I only include x2, but I omit x3. But x2 and x3 are strongly correlated. So I want to know by excluding x3, what is the impact on the slope parameter of x2? in this incorrect regression and then this is the equation that determines the direction of the bias on the slope parameter of x2 in the wrong regression i'm going to call it alpha 2 hat from now on it is equal to the equal to the product of the sine of b3 hat from the original regression so in other words we need to find out if it is positive or negative sign times the correlation coefficient we have to think using our theoretical thinking the sign actually of correlation coefficient between x2 and x3 and then we will do the first 2.1 and 2.2 of in class exercise 2.1 so let me explain it this is the correct regression expenditure is a function of price and income using theoretical thinking this should be negative because the higher the price it means the good is ex expensive then it will have negative impact on the spending and then this one b3 has should be positive because the higher the income the higher the income you earn the higher the expenditure okay and then in the second regression i only include price x2 but i exclude income x3 and i think x2 and x3 are strongly correlated okay so now i can make use of this equation to find out the direction of the bias okay oopsie i shouldn't underline the Okay, the sign of B3 head, we already know it is positive, so it is a positive amount times, now I have to think, what is the uh, correlation coefficient between X2 and X3, and I think the answer should be positive. Okay, the reason is, think about your first year economics, your demand supply analysis, if your income increases, let's say it is a normal good, if income increases, wouldn't there be an increase of demand for the product. Then it means demand curve shift rightwards. And if demand curve shift rightwards at the new equilibrium, price would increase. In other words, don't you think there is a positive relationship between income x3 and price x2? So in other words, I expect the correlation coefficient between x2 and x3 to have a positive sign. Okay, then positive times positive. Wouldn't my answer be positive on the left-hand side? Okay, so this is my explanation. Therefore, the direction of bias of excluding x3 on this slope parameter will be positive times positive, so upward bias. Okay, so maybe I will give you a random mathematical example. Maybe in the right regression, your b2 hat, this slope parameter will be minus 2. But then because of this upward bias by excluding income, upward bias maybe it increased to minus 1.5 but it is still negative but upward bias okay okay then i will do one more 2.3 i'm not going to explain it actually because the explanation is very detailed so i will just do one more question 2.2 Quantity of MP3 d mine is a function of X2 price of the CD. I think it makes sense to have a positive slope here because if CD is more expensive, people would rather purchase more MP3, which is a substitute of CD. And then the other one is price of MP3. It should be negative because of the law of d mine. The higher the price of MP3, the lower the quantity d mine. Inverse relationship between price and quantity d mine. So this is the correct regression. And then in the second regression, I commit underfitting because I exclude x3 the price of mp3 so now I want to know by excluding x3 the price of mp3 what is the impact on the slope parameter of x2 in the wrong regression okay so oopsie I already know the sign of b3 head is negative but now I need to think of the sign of the correlation between x2 and x3, which means these two variables. It should be positive, 
Yeah, because if MP3 becomes again using your first year's micro knowledge, if price of MP3 increases, it becomes more expensive, wouldn't people would purchase CD instead? Then it means there is an increase of demand for CD, then the demand curve of the CD uh, would shift rightwards. Then at the new equilibrium, the price of CD would also increase. So it means when the price of MP3 increases, it is just a matter of time before the price of CD would also increase. Then it means there is a positive correlation between X2 and X3. Okay, I think the explanation is quite clear in the bullet. Therefore, the direction of the bias on B2 head, alpha 2 head would be negative because we are multiplying a negative answer with a positive answer so it should be a downward bias here so a numerical example would be maybe in the correct regression for the price of cd the slope parameter could be 3.5 but then by committing underfitting there is a downward bias on the slope parameter then maybe it drops to 2.95 but it is still positive but you see the downward bias Okay, and then we want to move on with the official statistical test to test for specification bias. In other words, I want to run, this is an F test actually, to find out if I commit underfitting, overfitting, or using the wrong functional form. So let's go through the procedure. So I first run the so-called original or old regression, Y as a function of X2, whatever. And then I run a new regression, y as a function of still the same explanatory variables, but now I include y hat square, y hat cube, and they are derived from the original, original regression. So keep this in mind, because you might wonder where do these two new terms come from. Okay, then I run the five-step F test. It is actually the marginal contribution F test, which you learned way back in chapter eight. Okay. So can you go through the five steps before I will officially do two questions? Okay, there are a few more examples on the slides, but I want to focus on the in-class exercises. Okay, so let's look at this one. Okay, this is my original regression, y as a function of x. y stands for output, x stands for the uh, uh, labor quantity, actually. Okay, and then from this regression, I derive uh, y y hat square and y hat cubed, and I run a new regression. You can see the extra explanation, y hat comes from the first regression. So I run a new regression. You can see I add two additional explanatory variables. Okay. And then this is the answer, starting with the first step. New hypothesis, meaning this original regression is specified correctly. I already doubt it is specified correctly because do you see capital is missing. And nowadays we actually should include some inputs in connection with technology actually. Okay. Then this is alternative hypothesis. Computed F stats. Maybe let me copy this equation just in case. Oopsie. Okay, let's just give me a little bit of time, please. Okay. Computed F stat, the R square from the new regression, 0 0.9125. Minus the R square of the old regression, 0 0.7325, divided by the number of additional explanatory variables, 2. You see y hat square and y hat cube. Divided by 1 minus R square from the new regression, divided by m minus k. The k must come from the new regression, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then you get your computed F state, 16 point something. Okay? Critical F state, I'm not going to show you the F table. You would know degrees of freedoms of numerator is 2, degrees of freedoms of denominator is 16, and if you use the F table, I think alpha is given 5%.
critical F stat 3.63. Then since the computed F stat is greater than critical F stat, the new hypothesis is rejected. Then it means there must be something wrong with your original regression. So step five, interpretation. The regression, the original regression, it means equation 0, 1 is not specified correctly. Then you can speculate the possible reason. Perhaps the wrong functional form is used. Okay. The argument is that why don't you include labor square, capital square? It could be a uh, polynomial model. So maybe I'm using the wrong functional form. And I most likely commit underfitting because I exclude capital quantity. So in step five, you can speculate the possible specification bias. Is it underfitting, overfitting, or using the wrong functional form? Okay. Then we can do one more question. Okay. Marks explained by X2 study hours, X3, whether the student has a dog, I think that implies overfitting. X4, a dummy indicating if the student was born in December. So I think X3 and X4 are both irrelevant. So I think in this original regression, I already commit overfitting. Okay, and then from equation 0, 1, I extract the receipt, uh, not residuals, I mean y hat. Then I create y hat square y hat cube. Then I add it in the second regression. So now I can do the F test. I think the answers are self-explanatory, so can I leave it for one minute? And then I want you to focus on the most crucial, step five. And in this question, alpha is 1%. Okay, I hope you are happy with the first uh, detection test. It is called Ramsey Reset Test, which is virtually the marginal contribution F test, which you learn from chapter 8. And then we move on to the second test, which is called Lagrange Multiplier Test, LM test. Okay, so let's look at that. We first run the unrestricted regressions. Okay, and then we run the restricted regression. It means we actually impose some restrictions on, on maybe one or two slope parameters because we want to exclude one or two explanatory variables. And then I obtain the residual, and then I run an auxiliary regression. Residuals coming from which regression? The restricted regression is a function of all the explanatory variables from the unrestricted regression. And then I calculate n times r squared. Again, please use the right r squared. From the auxiliary regression and then finally the chi-square statistics. Degrees of freedom is actually the number of restrictions in the restricted regression. And if n times r square is greater than chi-square statistics, then we reject the new hypothesis, which is this one. Okay. So let's look at this question. This is my unrestricted regression. Okay y as a function of x, x squared, x cubed. So it means I want to have a, it is cost explained by output. I think from the unrestricted regression, I argue it should be a non-linear function. I think it is, if you remember your cost graphs from first years, it should be a polynomial model. But then I rather run the restricted regression this time. I kick out x2 squared and x3 squared. In other words, I actually impose two restrictions, which is b3 is zero and b4 is zero, so that all these terms will fall away. So in other words, I have two restrictions imposed. Auxiliary regression, then the residuals coming from, I just want to go back to the last slide, residuals coming from the restricted regression as a function of all the explanatory variables from the unrestricted regression, r squared, then now I can work out n times r squared from the auxiliary regression, 9.896. And then the chi-square degrees of freedom is the number of restriction 2, alpha is 1%, 9.21. Then since n times r squared is greater than chi-square state, we reject the new hypothesis. Meaning we 
meaning there is something wrong with the restricted regression. It is. So in other words, it means this restriction, restricted regression, with meaning just running it as a linear cost function is wrong. So we reject it. Or we can say the unrestricted regression is bad. 